The North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences was one of the pioneers in creating dioramas like this one, where plants, animals, and even sounds help to suggest a natural habitat. This diorama represents a longleaf pine savanna. You may know that the state flower is the dogwood, but the state tree is the pine. The most famous pine in North Carolina is the one referred to in our state toast. Here's to the land of the longleaf pine. If you live in the Piedmont or mountains, you may have never seen a longleaf forest, since most are located in the sand hills or southeastern coastal counties. A longleaf pine savanna is not dense or dark, but an open forest where the sun shines through. Forests like this one were once common in the southeastern U.S. The longleaf pine can be easily distinguished from other pines and evergreens. With its 10 to 18 inch needles, its large cones dwarf those of other conifers, such as the loblolly and pond pine. The variety of plant life here is staggering. It includes many carnivorous plants, such as sundews, pitcher plants, and the Venus flytrap, found only in North and South Carolina. Many of us have seen a Venus flytrap snap shut in a home or school terrarium. Some of my favorite creatures in the forest include hardworking woodpeckers, the scarlet king snake, Carolina gopher frog, and giant fox squirrel. Even though I've spent much time in these forests, I still have many questions. Today, we will visit with some friends and experts who can answer my questions and yours. To begin my quest for answers, I drove to the forest home of Audubon, North Carolina's educator and naturalist, Andy Wood. Longleaf pine savanna, like the one I'm standing in here, once covered about 93 million acres of the southeastern United States, ranging from Virginia to East Texas. In North Carolina alone, over 10 million acres once covered the coastal plain and southern Piedmont. Today, only 3,000 acres of that magnificent habitat remains, containing trees like this beast right here. Of course, the question is asked, why did those 3,000 acres survive? And the reason is largely because the trees were growing in very remote areas, often in very sandy or in mucky soils, so it just made it economically difficult to get to them. In fact, in some areas, a 300-year-old tree would be no larger than this one right here. In North Carolina, the 9 million acres that disappeared did so over about a 300-year period from colonial times until about the 1930s, first used for naval stores, including ships' masts, and then eventually for lumber. Finally, the land was cleared for agriculture. The history of the naval stores industry is a fairly complicated one. Larry Early, former editor of Wildlife in North Carolina Magazine, has spent years researching and writing a book about the naval stores industry and the longleaf pine. I asked Larry what attracted him to this subject. I wrote about longleaf pine because I was started out by being interested in turpentining, which is a product of a longleaf pine tree. But when I got into my research, I realized that I couldn't write about turpentining unless I understood something about the tree, and then it became something about the forest and onto the ecosystem, and it sort of grew from there. Since I've never completely understood the various components and products of the industry, I asked Larry to explain them. Turpentide is actually one of four products known as uh, Naval Stores products. Uh, I like to think of them as two pairs. You had tar and pitch, which came from the dead tree. People would pick up uh, fallen limbs, uh, pile them into a tar kiln, subject them to a low burning fire for several days, and take the running material that came out, and that would be collected in barrels, and that was called tar. The tar could also be burned in a kettle, 
and produce pitch, which is a, a more concentrated form of tar. Turpentine and rosin were the other two products, and they came from the living tree. Workers would scratch the tree with a metal tool, causing the gum to run. They would then take the gum to a distillery and uh, distill it. It made a very clear liquid called spirits of turpentine, and what was left over was called rosin. All of these products had multiple uses. Let me tell you how they used tar and pitch on board ships. Whalers sometimes would make three-year voyages, and among the stores they carried were a couple of barrels of tar. The tar could be used by the sailors, by the whalers, to coat the ropes to protect them from the corrosive salt air. Uh, they could also use the, pit, uh, the pitch or make pitch from tar uh, in order to patch a leak that might occur during the voyage. The legacy of the naval stores industry can be found in names all over eastern North Carolina. Tarboro, Tar River, and places called Pitch Kettle. But even these names don't begin to fully illustrate the importance of the longleaf pine industry. The naval stores industry was about as important to North Carolina a uh, hundred years ago as the oil industry is important to the world today. Uh, there were probably as many distilleries and tar kilns in the woods of North Carolina as there are oil wells in Texas today. The vast longleaf pine savannas began to disappear as land was cleared and trees were cut for ship's mast, lumber, and fencing. Later, large lumber operations became very efficient in cutting and transporting timber. Numbers were further reduced as old trees were bled to create products for the naval stores industry. Turpentine, pitch, and tar were shipped from small local operations to southeastern seaports such as Wilmington and Savannah. Little remains of this once important industry but a few old cat-faced trees. Pigs were another problem. In the 1800s, free-roaming swine rooted through the forest to the southeast and ate the grass stage of the longleaf, further diminishing its numbers. On land where the longleaf had been king, faster-growing pine species replaced it. Yes, many factors helped doom the once great forest but one important piece of the puzzle is still missing. The final problem facing the longleaf was not fire, but the absence of fire. I've known for years that for the longleaf to survive and flourish, they must have fire. No one can explain this riddle, the need for fire in the forest, better than Jesse Perry of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Jesse has led field trips to southeastern forest for over 20 years. The longleaf pine has a number of adaptations to fire. It's one of the most fireproof trees in the whole state. Um, one is the bark, and you can see that this tree has been burned repeatedly uh, by the charred bark. It, uh, it helps the tree survive, nice thick bark. Another trick it has up its sleeve is the baby pine tree, which looks like a big clump of grass, and we call it the grass stage. And it keeps its bud right near the ground. And the hottest part of the flame is up several feet. The coolest part is right near the ground, so the fires just sweep over the grass stage and it survives. It may get its needles burned off, but that bud will survive and it's not growing up. It may take it up to 10 years to start growing up, but it's growing down. It's growing a great big thick taproot full of nutrients. And once that root gets to be about an inch thick, the pine will shoot up and grow through the area of maximum temperature that a fire would produce. And then it's gonna be pretty much clear sailing on up to being a big tree.
The longleaf pine is a key species in a very diverse community. In fact, there are about 600 plants associated with the longleaf pine forest. And foremost among these is the wire grass. And this is a grass that is very tough and has very woody leaves, which are highly flammable. And this is one of the reasons that longleaf pine forests catch on fire so easily. Um, in fact, even after just less than two weeks, you can see that the wire grass has sprouted out several inches. Later on, other plants will be coming up, and after a few years, things will start to get thick, and you'll need another fire to keep things from succeeding into oaks and other trees, which will eventually replace the longleaf pine forest. I understand how the longleaf pine, wire grass, and other tough plants survive an inferno, but what about these delicate flowers? Flowers like the pitcher plant and Venus flytrap. How do they survive fire? Like the grass stage of the longleaf pine, these fantastic pitcher plants need plenty of light. And this is delivered courtesy of frequent ground fires, which burn off the shrubs and keep everything nice and open. If the shrubs were allowed to grow, they would overshadow them and they would die. The pitcher plant lures insects into its tubular leaf, and they drown in a pool of fluid inside and are digested and absorbed. Also native to areas right around the longleaf pines are the famous Venus flytraps. And these live only in a 70 mile radius around Wilmington. They catch insects by snapping shut on them. And again, they digest and absorb them. There are also many, many other spectacular wildflowers living in the land of the longleaf pine. A hundred years ago, a lightning strike in North Carolina could start a blaze that would burn thousands of acres. Today, however, such fires are rare because of large fields like this one, and interstate highways, man-made barriers. So how do we get fire in the longleaf forest of today? To answer that question, let's visit with Margit Booker of the North Carolina Nature Conservancy. Margit is a trained ecologist charged with managing thousands of acres. She explained why she must set fire in the forest. Lightning was not producing enough fire to maintain the ecosystem, so I had to learn, like many other Conservancy staff, on how to use prescribed burns to safely apply them to maintain the ecosystems. The open park-like conditions that you find in longleaf pine savannas would not exist without fire. So we used prescribed fire on somewhere one to 10 year return interval to maintain these open systems. To the Conservancy as well as to other fire manager staff, safety is paramount. We do very careful burn planning before we start any fires and then we have a safety equipment on site which includes safety equipment for our staff and then we have equipment to start fires like drip torches and we have uh, equipment like these pumper trucks to put the fires out in case they should not behave as designed. If you enjoy looking for unusual birds and mammals, there's no better place than a longleaf forest. One of my favorite birds lives in this tree. It's a red-headed woodpecker. Now the red-headed woodpecker has a bright red head and a crisp black and white tuxedo. It's one of the most elegant birds in the forest. Here you'll also find the endangered red cockaded woodpecker, the signature bird of the longleaf pine forest. And finally, there's the eastern fox squirrel, the Godzilla of all squirrels. It's about three times the size of a gray squirrel.
To find out how these animals cope with fire, let's meet with Brady Beck of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. The longleaf pine forest provides suitable habitat for a number of interesting species. Two of these that are fairly common in the area that many people have not seen before are the eastern fox squirrel. Quite interesting in their color variation. You can be anywhere from pitch black to almost looking just like a large gray squirrel. And the other species that's uh, interesting and in this habitat provides critical nesting and foraging habitat for them is the red cockaded woodpecker. Brady explained to me that red cockaded woodpeckers are cooperative breeders. This means that the whole family works together. A male and female with young male offspring makes up the family. Together this group or family unit defends their territory against other red cockaded woodpeckers. They excavate or dig out cavities in live old pine trees. Finally, they maintain their trees by causing a constant sap flow that make these trees look like candles. The sticky flow acts as a barrier to snakes and other predators. When fire creeps through the sand hills, there are different responses by different sized critters to avoid the fire. That's something the size of a deer could very easily run away from a fire or run across a road where the fire wouldn't cross the road. Something the size of a fox squirrel would very easily run up to the top of a canopy of a pine tree or an oak tree to get away. Something the size of a red cockaded woodpecker, the birds would just fly away, the adults would. The young would often survive the fire being safe in the cavity. I suppose it makes sense that animals that can fly, climb trees, and run fast can get away from fire. But what about reptiles and amphibians? This is a beautiful yellow-bellied slider found in a pond in Longleaf Forest. The reptiles and amphibians have to get away too. To discover the escape techniques used by these creatures, the person to see is Alvin Braswell, chief herpetologist at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. The longleaf pine woods look fairly sterile to most people once they walk out into them. They see pine trees and various species of grass and weeds. But if you look real close, you find out that there's a lot more there. There are 28 to 30 species of snakes that live in those woods and associated habitats. One of the more common species that you're likely to see is the black racer. They're active by day. If you're just walking out in the woods, one's likely to be seen scooting away from you into the weeds. The longleaf pine woods are a habitat that's been greatly reduced in the southeastern United States. There are two species of snakes that we're particularly concerned about. They're species of special concern in North Carolina. The southern hognose snake is a small species that, with a nice turned up snout. It feeds on uh, spadefoot toads and it's declining throughout much of its range. We very well may have the best remaining population of southern hognose snakes here in the sand hills of North Carolina. Another species of special concern, and a very large species, up to six feet, is the northern pine snake. They live out in these woods also. They burrow into stump holes. They're active by day when they're on the surface. They feed on mice and occasional bird eggs. It's a big, colorful, impressive snake. On another trip with Alvin, he showed me another impressive snake of the longleaf forest, an eastern coach whip, which can reach seven feet in length. It is a fast predator that can easily escape a fire using its knowledge of the stumps and holes in its range. But my favorite snake in these forests is the small, beautiful scarlet king snake that is also well adapted to fire. Alvin also showed me a variety of lizards common to these forests, including the eastern fence lizard and the southeastern five-line skink. These know how to duck when fire sweeps through the forest. These longleaf pine woods are really a wonderland for herpetologists 
not only is there a great diversity of snakes and lizards here, but there's a huge diversity of amphibians also. Amphibian diversity is supported by ephemeral ponds to a large extent. Ephemeral is a word meaning short-lived. So when these ponds, or actually very large puddles, appear in Longleaf Forest, Alvin Braswell is a happy camper. He is a man at peace when working these ponds. Each net holds for him the possibility of discovery. He knows the amphibians of the area can survive fire. Ephemeral ponds are a habitat type that's uh, important to the amphibians that um, can't cope with predators in a pond like fish that you have in most permanent ponds. Ephemeral ponds are dry part of the year and they fill usually in the winter and keep water up through the midsummer or so. And there are a whole host of amphibians that use these sites because they don't have the predator pressures there that they have in normal ponds. Ephemeral ponds can support 15 to 18 species of frogs and toads. A common species that has just recently been breeding at this site is the southern toad. The leopard frog is a common species in sites like this. Uh, the tadpoles are impressive. They can be found anytime there's water in one of these ponds. Although ephemeral ponds are fish free, they do have predators, and the longer the water stays in the pond, the predator populations build. I'm talking about dragonfly nymphs, predaceous beetles, and their larvae. These critters eat tadpoles. Again, all the life in these ponds continues to flourish because of the fires that help sustain the surrounding forest. We told you early in this episode that only 3,000 acres of the original longleaf pine savannas survived. And fortunately, today, more is being restored. There is no better place for discovering unique reptiles and amphibians. Rare birds like the red cockaded woodpeckers, and gardens like the pitcher plants around me. There is no better place for exploring North Carolina.